Good morning and welcome. This is uh, February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day, by the way. Uh, today we're filming in, in Monticello, downtown Monticello, Wisconsin. My name's Pastor Lance Smith, and this is the worship time for Zwingli UCC uh, in Monticello, Wisconsin. We're glad that you're with us today. Today is the last Sunday in this holiday season called Epiphany. This is the last epiphany of Jesus, and it takes place on a mountaintop. So this is the closest thing to mountains we have in Monticello, or the mountains of snow that are piled up around all the parking areas and all the streets. Uh, we hope to be thawed out by at least July, uh, but here we are. It's a balmy six degrees when we're filming this, and uh, we are glad that you're with us, but not glad that you're actually with us because it's a little chilly out here. So. Uh, got some things I'd like for you to remember and some people I'd like for you to think about in your prayers. Um, first of all, I'd like for you to remember to pray for all the people that have been touched by this virus. And pray for a speedy, uh, speedy vaccination rate. Uh, if you have not been vaccinated, you might want to call your health department and find out when you can get in because there's a lot of empty slots right now. So you might want to get in there and get your appointment made. It's something that you're going to have to do for yourself. Nobody's going to call you, so make sure you call them. Um, but anyway, uh, pray for a speedy inoculation of our, of our nation to try to get us back to where we can have some sense of normality. Uh, normality. Um, I'd like for you to remember next Sunday is our drive-in service at Zwingli. I'm hoping it's not too bad. I'm hoping it, if it's like this, we'll have it because uh, we can we can tolerate this, but if it's bitter cold, we may have to cancel. So keep in touch. Check out your Facebook pages. Uh, we'll send out emails, let you know what's going on. Uh, but anyway, hope, hopefully we can have, have our service, our drive-in service next weekend. Also next Wednesday is a joint Ash Wednesday service. Uh, we're going to do this with Washington Church. Pastor Kelly has written a wonderful, wonderful service. Uh, we're going to be having a special guest musician, Peggy Miller. Uh, I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. So tune in Wednesday evening for that service. I'd like to greet you the way we greet on every Sunday morning. The Lord is with you. This call to worship is written by Reverend Roddy Hamilton and is posted on his Listening to Stones website. It's from Mark 9, 2 through 8. Behind all things, behind the gray surface, there is glory escaping, born of heaven and belongs to heaven, a light that welcomes, a more profound way of seeing things that transfigures the world, that casts a spell of hope, that sees the glory in the cross and life within death. It is a glory that meets us here on this mountain where Jesus Christ, covered in dust of the world, is caught up in the glory of heaven. Welcome to the mountain. Let us pray. Lord, we do not know what to say, for we are afraid. But a cloud overshadows us, and a voice comes to us. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Lord, we listen today. Lord, we are listening. Amen. Maybe God is like that too. Written by Jennifer Grant, illustrated by Benjamin Chipper. I live in the city where the sidewalks and subway cars and buildings and buses are packed with people. But I've never seen God before. Grandma, does God live in the city? I ask one morning at breakfast. Yes, God is here, she says. You just need to know where to look. Whenever you see love, joy, and peace, God is there she says, stirring her tea. Wherever there's patience, kindness, and goodness, God is there too. 
When you see faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, that's God's Spirit at work. On the way to school, I'm on the lookout. I see a bus full of tourists and count ten bright yellow taxis. I spy a man sweeping a stoop, and Grandma and I laugh when we see a tiny dog wearing a fluffy purple sweater. At school, Grandma hands me my lunch and hugs me close before she says goodbye. That's what love looks like to me. Maybe God is like that too. On the swings, I pump so hard, I see over the wall into the alley. My friends shout, higher, higher, as my feet fly way up in the sky. That's what joy looks like to me. Maybe God is like that too. Outside, car horns blast and sirens scream, but my classroom is quiet and calm. That's what peace looks like to me. Maybe God is like that too. I try to tie my shoes, but the laces tangle around my fingers. My teacher sits down beside me and shows me how to tie them. That's what patience looks like to me. Maybe God is like that too. On the way home, I see a doorman wearing a red cape and a hat with a shiny brim. He's holding the door for a man using a wheelchair. The man moves very slowly, and the doorman chats with him and smiles. That's what kindness looks like to me. Maybe God is like that too. While I'm setting the table for dinner, there's a knock on the door. It's our neighbor from downstairs, bringing us a loaf of bread. It's golden brown and warm, wrapped in a thin white blanket. That's what goodness looks like to me. Maybe God is like that too. After dinner, I work on my homework while Grandma stands at the kitchen sink washing dishes and humming to herself just like she does every night. That's what faithfulness looks like to me. Maybe God is like that too. At bedtime, Grandma sits at the edge of my bed, singing me a lullaby and stroking my head. She tucks my blankets up close around me. That's what gentleness looks like to me. Maybe God is like that too. I lie in bed, watching the curtains flutter. I want to talk about that dog we saw today, and how high I can swing, but Grandma says that once I'm tucked in, I have to stay in bed till morning. I close my eyes and try to fall asleep. That's what self-control looks like to me, but maybe God is like that too. I saw God over and over again today, whenever I saw love, joy, and peace, and wherever there was patience, kindness, and goodness. When I saw faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, I saw God's Spirit at work. I don't see God the way I see my friends, or the street lights, or the river, but I see signs of God's Spirit all around me right here in the city. I know what God is like. Maybe I can be like that too. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Galatians 5.22.23 
scripture is from Mark 8, verses 31 through 38, and Mark 9, verses 2 through 8. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your, your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them any more, but only Jesus. Today, our story comes at the end of the season of Epiphany. You know, that time when we realize just exactly who Jesus is. The past few weeks, more and more has been revealed about this character in this gospel story that Mark has written for us. We've heard the voice of John the Baptist saying, you know, this is the one. This is the one that I've been telling you about. This is the one that, that's come to take my place. The one that I'm not worthy to tie his sandals. It's also the, the voice you've heard about. He's the one from the demons as they ran screaming from the people that Jesus healed and the unclean spirits that he exercised from people and they leave their bodies, you hear them screaming that this is Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. At the baptism, we heard and Jesus heard, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Today, we have one last epiphany, one last revelation about who Jesus is from another source. We find ourselves with Jesus in the inner circle of disciples, you know, Simon Peter, uh, James and John. Those are some of the first, those are the first disciples that he called, and they're kind of his inner circle. Earlier in Mark, this same group was discussing actually who Jesus is. Jesus asked them, who do they say I am? Who do you say I am? And there are all kinds of different answers. So we find ourselves as we go up this mountain, the four of them go up the mountain and all at once the disciples are blinded by the countenance of Jesus. Though they know it's him, they, they still can't quite understand this indescribable aura that surrounds him. He's a glow or encircled by the energy that is bright light. Some presence beyond words, they just can't, can't explain it. 
And then even stranger things happen. It's interesting that, that Monticello is covered in a blanket of white because those are the liturgical colors for today because they hearken back to this, this scene right here where Jesus was surrounded by a bright white light. And so white is the liturgical color for the day. If I were in the sanctuary, I'd be wearing a white stole. But then something stranger happens. Two figures appear beside Jesus, not in front of him, not behind him, but beside him. And an even stranger thing happens, if you ask me, the disciples at once realized it was Moses and Elijah, that they were standing there with him. And that's even stranger because these are not just prophets. These are not just leaders of the Jewish faith. These are the premier leaders and prophets of the Jewish faith. You know, Moses was the one that led the Israelites in, in the Exodus story and, and took them across the Red Sea and, and, and helped them out of Egypt. He's the person that talked with God. Moses was on the mountain when God gave him the law. Moses was the transition for the Jewish faith to an organized nation, an organized religion. The bringer of the law, not just the Big Ten, not just the Ten Commandments, but all the laws attributed to Moses, all the laws that make the, the, the Israelites special and different from everybody else, from every other nation in the known world. And then in the same light, we see this fellow named Elijah. He's another transition person in the Jewish faith. His ministry was at a time when, when the Jews were surrounded by foreign gods. The faith was underground. Elijah saw God in a moment of silence on another mountaintop. Elijah's return was an element of the prophet Malachi's prediction of the coming of the Lord's Day prophecies. And that belief that Elijah would be coming before the Lord came back or before the Messiah was so strong that every Passover they set a cup for him, an empty cup, the Elijah cup, because they were expecting to come, him to come for the Seder dinner. The greatest of all prophets, and he never knew death, he was taken up, he was transfigured into heaven in a fiery chariot. The appearance of both these figures spoke volumes to the early Christian church. Everyone in Mark's audience would have recognized these two figures. They would have known what they meant too, the laws and the prophets. Here we see Jesus not coming to replace them, but as a fulfillment of them. He stands before them. This is to symbolize that he is the fulfillment of the laws and words of the prophets. Then a cloud obscures the three, and now we hear the voice of God for a second time. But this time we know that all the disciples hear it as well. This time proclaiming who Jesus is. It's not clear who, who actually heard it the first time. Was it just Jesus? Was it just us? or was it everybody that was at his baptism? But it's very clear that the disciples heard God say, this is my son. This is my son. Hmm. And then the directive to listen to him. That left them suddenly looking around only to see Jesus. That phrase, listen to him, counteracts the babble that Peter is attempting with his suggestion of tents of tabernacles, of, of shrines, not understanding what kind of God he's dealing with. Peter, Peter's wanting to make this a holy place where people would make pilgrimages to and, and bow down before these temples and these shrines. The question of who Jesus is and the purpose is now revealed to them. Connections must have, must have been made back in the beginning of the Jewish people's relationship with their God. You must understand that the people reading Mark's gospel or hearing it hearing it read, would totally make the connection of Jesus with Elijah and Moses. Symbols and prophecies were presenting evidence that Jesus is the Christ. And that word Christ is an interesting word. That's the Greek word for Messiah. The one that they have been waiting for, the champion of God's kingdom, the salvation of the nation of Israel. So you can imagine how the disciples are feeling and thinking their heads are reeling. They thought they were following a good teacher and a healer, and, and now it's been replaced by a higher paradigm. So what are we to do with that information, they say. Tell no one until after the resurrection, Jesus says. 
And that's something that's puzzled people for a long time, the, the secretive nature of the book of Mark. Why does Jesus keep saying, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody? Could it be that no one is really ready to hear this message yet? I don't know whether you remember the movie A Few Good Men where Jack Nicholson says, the truth, you can't handle the truth. That might be where everybody was. They had to see the entire picture. The whole story had to be revealed. The whole thing from, from start to finish after the resurrection. And then everything made sense. Like those mystery movies that you don't really know until like the last five minutes. And then the whole picture is just like, oh, so that's why that happened. Oh yeah, I get it now. That's what this gospel of Mark is like. This, this concept of transfiguration has always challenged me. I've, I've always had trouble teaching this, especially like in Sunday school classes to, and you know, children's sermons to younger ones. You know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's different. How, accurate, how to accurately illustrate what's going on here and, and what, is it, what the good news is about it. I think we all have our idea about what God looks like. And in the slurry of ideas, images that flew through our minds, we, we might see Charlton Heston with a long white beard, or maybe some of us see Ryan Reynolds, I don't know. Maybe, maybe he's got a great white beard too, or maybe Charlize Theron in, in a silk gown, or maybe our grandmother or grandfather, or maybe just a mass of brilliant light, something that we can't really explain. This concept of transfiguration, taking on the image or countenance of God, intrigues me. The word countenance, boy, there's an old timey word. I remember hearing that word from my grandmother. She used to use that a lot, but you rarely hear it in conversation anymore. Countenance, your persona, the total package, the image that you project. In the Bible, these folks who have a close encounter with God seem to glow or reflect an unexplainable essence. Moses had a different appearance when he came down from the mountain. Remember in, in the Ten Commandments when you saw that movie? When he came down after talking to the burning bush, his, his beard and his hair were suddenly white. Hmm. It's just unexplainable. You can't seem to explain what the difference is. You just know that there's something different about that person. You just know in your heart something awesome has happened. It's happening or will happen. I wonder how many of us have seen the presence of the Creator in others. I believe that God lives within and around each of us and among us. Perhaps when we're the most in tune with God's purpose, we may actually be transfigured as well. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we individually are the Christ, but we're part and pa parcel to the body of Christ. Christ's work is accomplished by the members of his body. I know that when, when we are most in tune with Christ, that we feel empowered, loved, exceptional, holy. Could it be that we're glowing when we feel this way? I'm not sure. Of course, we would all love to stay on the mountaintop with Jesus, Moses and Elijah, and the disciples, but the glory of God is still yet to be revealed in this book of Mark. We must trudge back down the mountain and deal with those demons that enslave the people and our fellow human beings. Demons of fear, greed, injustice, hunger, sickness. We must journey up to the cross to truly understand the glory of this king. It's in the valley of, for, for it's in the valley for the shadow of death that, that Christ's glory is truly revealed in a big way. It is Christ's walk through the hard times and death, then into the resurrection that make the story beyond equal. That moment on the mountain allows Peter, James, and John a glimpse of the truth, a validation of their work and ministry. I believe it was revealed to them so they would, they would have strength to continue the journey. These glimpses allow them hope in the upcoming times of devastating pain emptiness and discouragement. When there seemed to be no hope, they needed a little glimpse to carry them to the other side, some faith booster. And so we must too take those little glimpses of God we encounter everywhere and every day to, to sustain us as we continue 
to work for justice, peace, and love. And so the lectionary shares with us the chosen few, the inner circle, a vision of who we follow to sustain us as we devolve, delve into the darkness and shadows of Lent and Holy Week and the cross. The story continues. It is retold, relived throughout our lives. The journey to Jerusalem is about to begin. Amen. Lord, we're here on this last day of Epiphany, the day that you proclaim that Jesus is your Son, your Beloved, the Messiah that we've all been waiting for, the way and the light. Help us to realize that as we are trans transformed into beings of the light, as we walk this journey and, and become more and more the body of Christ. Help us to remember this day. Help us to remember this mountaintop experience and couple it with all the many mountaintop experiences that we have had. And remember those times as we walk through the valleys and the low times of life and the times when we when fear threatens to take our faith. We know that you are with us, Lord. We know that you walk among us. We know that you work through us. Let us be ever mindful of your presence. We ask this in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now as we go forth from this place, help us to always be ever searching for those little glimpses of the Christ, those little epiphanies, those little transfiguration moments, that, that brilliant white light that we see every day around us. Help that to be the thing that boosts us because we know it's not seeing that's believing, but believing that is seeing. Amen. Amen.